I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Dustin Butler, and uh, I work with Pioneer Health and Missions from the United States. And uh, I'd just like to uh, thank, from the bottom of my heart, RM, for having me over here. Um, they have been so hospitable to me, um, Bill and Chris and his wife and uh, Neville and Stefan. It's just been real nice to come to a place I've never been to before, but kind of feel at home right away because of the, the kindness that has been shown to me. So I want to thank them personally for that. And I also want to thank uh, RM as an organization for, um, for holding up the standard in Australia. I believe that um, uh, you folks are really blessed to have a ministry that is so dedicated to the truth, no matter what the cost. And that is a rare thing today. And so um, thank God for what, what you have and support them and uh, with your prayers and however you can. I'd like to start out with a word of prayer and then we'll get into the message. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your loving kindness and patience with us. You've been striving with, with your people for so many years. And uh, as we will find out, your son and you are waiting with longing desire to see a manifestation of your character in your church. I believe I am among those today that will help fulfill that purpose for you and your cause and your kingdom. I thank you for this opportunity to share your word. I pray that the words I speak would be edifying and be easy to understand and uh, to be practical uh, for day-to-day -day godly living uh, for all of those that will hear. And uh, I pray that um, if I misspeak or if I say anything amiss, that you would forgive me and that uh, you would educate the ears that hear any error uh, to the truth. And I pray this thing not because uh, I deserve an audience with the king of the universe, but because the king's son died for me and afforded me that privilege. In his name I pray, amen. Today our um, topic is going to be the character of the last generation. And... The reason this topic is dear to me is because before I learned the truth about God and his son, I learned about justification by faith, as well as I could without this current truth. And um, I, I, saw a new, I saw a new perspective of why it has taken so long for Christ to come back. I was introduced to uh, ideas that were foreign to me, and I was introduced to the truth, I believe. And it made so much sense that, um, that Christ is waiting on a people. And so we're going to take a look at that concept today. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with this term, last generation, but... Um, we're going to look at what that term means and where it came from, and we're also next going to look through the scriptures and see how the scriptures describe this last generation, what terminology uh, the Bible uses, and finally we're going to go, uh, go for a little journey through the spirit of prophecy and see how detailed Ellen White gets uh, when describing this people. So, how many of you, by a show of hands, believe in character perfection? All right, so a lot of hands are going up. Have you ever tried to share this belief with others that don't believe it? What do you, what, what kind of responses do you get? Perf perfection, what was that? Legalism, yes, okay, so that's key in on that, remember that word. Um, have you ever tried to defend that uh, belief from Scripture? It's not always the easiest thing because our Western mindset uses words like perfection 
and uh, sinlessness and holiness. And when you go to defend this idea that God is waiting on a people from the Bible, you won't find some of these terms. Not as readily as uh, the terms that God has chosen to reveal this truth to us. And so hopefully, um, by uh, going through the Bible and going through the spirit of prophecy today, we will uh, give you some, some ammunition, some tools to, to use uh, while, while sharing to others this truth. Uh, one of the best known proponents of this idea in Seventh-day Adventist history is a man by the name of M. L. Andreasen. And he wrote a book called The Sanctuary Service. I'm going to read a little, little section here, a little paragraph or two. And it will give you an idea, kind of a summary, of um, how he viewed this, uh, this, this theology. Will they stand the test? To humanize, it seems impossible. If only God would come to their rescue, all would be well. They are determined to resist the evil one. If need be, they will die, but they will not sin. Satan has no power and never has had to make any man sin. Amen? He can tempt, he can seduce, he can threaten, but he cannot compel. And now God demonstrates through the weakest of the weak that there is no excuse and never has been any for sinning. If men in the last generation can successfully repel Satan's attack, if they can do this with all the odds against them, and the sanctuary closed, what excuse is there for men's ever sinning? Does that make sense? That all fits, right, with the way that, that we think and the way that we believe. But can you defend it? That's the question today. Now, this is a quote from an article written by a man named Angel Manuel Rodriguez. How many of you heard of him? He used to be the head of the BRI, right? He has a little different perspective on this theology. He's not too keen to this idea. This theology introduced a strong element of legalism, the word that was brought up back there, in some sectors of the church by claiming that the character of God, maligned by Satan, in the co cosmic conflict will be vindicated through the holy and perfect life of obedience of the last generation of believers. This generation will uh, reach a level of character development unequaled in Christian history, copying perfectly in their lives what God did in Christ. Once this happens, the Lord will return. This theology seeks to explain why the Lord has not returned and the nature and purpose of Christian perfection. It is based primarily on a particular reading of the writings of Ellen White. And you see all the code words that he's using in here, all the extreme language, so that the reader of this article will never want to touch this concept their entire lives. They will want to get near it. He's also confusing a perfect life with perfect character. He's leading the reader to believe that you have to live an entire perfect life like Christ to reach this level. How many of you have lived an entirely perfect life from your birth? Zero hands. So he's painting this in a wrong light to scare the reader. If you search the scriptures, like I said before, for, thing, for words or phrases like character perfection or sinless perfection, you'll be hard-pressed to find good evidence for this theology. We're going to go through several scriptures, and we're going to see how the Word of God teaches us that this is truth. Our first verse is Mark 4, 28. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, then the, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle. Who is he? And he does it through his servants, we'll find out too. Because the harvest is come. That's pretty clear, right? Now, when the harvest is at the stage of the blade, is it ready for harvest? Not yet, right? It's just a babe. It's just a little sprout. Is it perfect? Can it be perfect? Sure. Perfection is 
let's talk about the blade first. Perfection is when the gardener or the farmer goes out to the blade and it is right where it's supposed to be. The husbandman has given it everything it needs and it has taken advantage of everything it's been fed and it's just where it needs to be. Does the farmer or gardener expect fruit from that blade? No, but it can still be perfect. It's right where the husbandman wants it. What about the ear? Not yet, right? Full corn in the ear. It has reached full maturity. The husbandman goes out and sees full maturity. Then it's time for the harvest. If you just had this verse alone, I think it would be enough. This is very clear teaching, but we're going to see that the Bible is riddled with evidence that God is waiting for a people. John 4.35, Say not ye there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. So if you go down and you buy a pack of seeds, and the seeds say they're tomato seeds, and you plant a little tomato garden in your backyard, and um, you look on the back of the pack, and it says what month these seeds will be ready with fruit. Do you rely on that pack and leave your garden alone, let it grow on its own, and stick religiously to that pack and go out on that day of the month, and you're going to harvest those seeds? You're going to harvest that fruit? No, that's not how it works, right? There are certain times a year that a, a harvest should be ready, but it doesn't always work out that way, does it? There's variation. And so the husbandman wants to harvest when it's ready, not when it should be ready. When should the Seventh-day Adventist church have been ready for harvest? Decades and decades and decades ago. If God would have used that mentality, we wouldn't have our theme today. There would have been no hold, hold, hold. There would have been many found wanting. Revelation 14, 15. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. This is another instance that the time depends on the ripeness of the harvest. It's not because um, someone was fed an arbitrary time that the harvest had to happen no matter what. It's always dependent upon the readiness of the fruit. Matthew 13, 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them into bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So now we're introduced into the idea that there are two harvests, one for the wicked and one for the righteous. And it makes all the more sense when you add this element, right? Both are going to come to maturity. Both are going to be ready for harvest. And incidentally, they're going to be ready for harvest at the same time. They're both going to reach their full, um, full maturity at the same time. Joel 3.13, put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Here we have another picture of the wicked harvest coming to full maturity. And this next verse we're going to look at is a solemn warning. It, um, it, if dwelt upon, it could bring you to tears. Just the thought that these words, if, if we don't take advantage of everything that God has afforded us, if we don't take advantage of that, we could be repeating these, these words. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. May none of us be faced with this, this sentence, this self-sentence of death the realization that we've not done everything we could to obey God's word and to do our, uh, the, the duty that he's given us. Now we're going to get um, 
our first clue, biblically, why Christ has not come. James 5, 7 to 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath, hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. So we see now the Lord is waiting. Um, this is why the commission of the angel went forth to cry out, hold, 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 hold. Did the angels know that God's people weren't ready? Those angels, the angels that were letting loose the winds of strife, did they know that God's people weren't ready? It doesn't seem like it, does it? Who knew? Our God, Christ knew. Christ knew that... Um, that unless he stopped those winds from being released, um, we will find out that it would be more devastating than just a few um, that weren't ready that would have lost their lives. I've got a quote that I'll share with you later that um, I think it's going to be in tomorrow's uh, presentation that uh, the implications are... Um, are widespread and eternal, and it has to do with the entire great controversy. This wasn't just to save a few lives. This was to save everything. So it says here that we need the, uh, the latter rain. So what is the latter rain? I know that um, in California, where I'm from, they, uh, there are a group of people in our conference that once a year, I believe it's in January, they pray for 10 days, I think, for the latter rain. They pray for the Holy Spirit. And it saddens me now because I know these, these group of sincere people have no idea what they're praying for. They're, they're praying for power to do something that they, that they don't want to do in the first place. They want to be controlled by God. They don't want to have to make decisions to go out and do what God bids them to do. They want to be um, possessed, in a sense, and do things that, you know, they want to preach the gospel to the world. And my question is, why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you doing it right now? The rain is falling, amen? amen. And they don't see it. And that Ellen White brings this up. The rain might be falling all around you, and you don't even know. We're going to find out uh, what this rain is. Deuteronomy 32, verses 1 through 3. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, and the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. So what we see here is doctrine is rain. Have any of you been learning doctrines in the past five to ten years that have changed your life? Amen. That is the rain. The latter rain is falling all around us. Have you gotten any on you? <laughs> Hopefully so. Um, because if you're dry, you're missing out. It's falling all around us, and if we don't realize it and take advantage of every opportunity and every doctrine and every truth that God is is revealing to us, you may be weighed in the balances and found wanting. 1 John 3, 2 through 3, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Amen? For we shall see him as he is. Fifteen years ago, did some of you see God for who he really was? I know I didn't. I think I'm coming closer now to seeing who he really is. I believe this verse is talking about us and this movement. We, we will see God as he really is, and we will be like him. And every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. 
We're told to be perfect, even as our Father in heaven is perfect. These, um, these thoughts are what some call the higher than the highest thoughts that man can have. And um, these are some of the precious gifts that God has given us, that we can believe that this is actually possible. Most of the world, including Seventh-day Adventists, believe that this is an impossibility to live a life like Christ, to have a character like his, and to respond to temptation like Christ responded. He recoiled from sin. Do we recoil from sin every time it knocks at our door? This is what God is longing for our lives. He wants us to have that experience. So now we're going to take a look at Revelation 14, but before I go there, what do you think of when I say Revelation 14? Three angels' messages, right? What verse would you start at? Six. Why do you start at six? Why does everyone jump to six? (laughs) We're going to read verses one through five. I just, I don't know why, I realized this uh, about a year ago, and I thought, why do, why do we always skip to six, you know? Um, we're, we're skipping a really good part. So let's read, read through it here. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Sion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as, it, <clears throat> as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping, with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And before we talk specifically about these five verses, I want to ask you a question about cookbooks. Um, when you are looking for a cookbook, what, what is your first what is the first thing that you're seeking? What are you looking for first? Say you're, say you're somewhere and you're looking at cookbooks. What, what's going to appeal to you first? The pictures, right? You're not going to look at the ingredients first necessarily, but you will get there because we all want to know what's in our food. But those pictures are what draws you in, right? You've just seen a picture painted of who God's remnant are, who the last generation is. This should make us want to know exactly how they got there. Just like we want to know how the picture of this beautiful dish gets to where it's at. That's why we want want that cookbook, right? We want to make that food. We want to make something just like that, and then we want to enjoy it. Well, God has shown us a picture of the 144,000. And what's interesting is, The rest of what we normally read as the three angels' messages, do you know what Ellen White calls those? The three steps. One, two, and three. They are actually steps that get the 144,000 to this place that's been revealed to us in verses one through five. So that's that's where our minds should go when we start reading Revelation 14. We should read about this group and say, wow, this is impossible, isn't it? And then read the three angels' messages and see how they were transformed. To see the steps they went through and the experience. We're going to talk about that tomorrow, the experience of the last generation. Because it's not just about having someone wave a wand above your head and giving you a spiritual mind. It's about experience. It's about hard and stern battles with self. There must be a day-by-day transformation of mind. No one gets there overnight. I know some of you are marathon runners. It takes training to run a marathon. You don't wake up one morning after being a couch potato and say, I'm going to run a marathon today. It doesn't work. You won't get far. It's the same way in the spiritual life. 
No one can give you a pill or wave something over your head and make you run a marathon. God doesn't do that either when he prepares his children for eternity with him and prepares them to replace the holy, the angels that used to be holy that squandered their birth, birthright to follow Lucifer. We're going to replace them. You know that the number of redeemed will equal the number of fallen angels, right? That's what God is, is preparing. He's bringing heaven back to where it was and even better, if that were possible. Look at verse 5. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. What kind of language is that? Who have you heard those words spoken of before? It's Christ. It's Christ. 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22, For even hereunto we were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. You know, you have the phrase here in Australia that um, if you want to understand me, walk a mile in my shoes, right? Jesus walked more than a mile in our shoes. He was tempted beyond what any of us will ever be tempted with. He was tempted with things that we'll never experience. He walked in our shoes and more. Verse 22 says, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Those are the same words that are spoken of about the uh, 144,000. And Christ is waiting to speak them about every, everyone here, you and I. Ephesians 4, 12 and 13, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. I'm going to stop there for a second. I've only been in this movement for a couple years, a few years, and I want to let you know how much of uh, a disappointment it was to me when I found out that the movement was, was splintered. Um, I remember being an, a naive uh, new believer and going up to uh, a lady at a camp meeting and said, well, why don't, why don't all the leaders get together? Why don't they just all get together and, you know, and, and, and unify and let's finish this work? And she laughed at me. Out loud, she laughed at me and says, oh, dear brother, you're so naive. It's all been tried before. You know, and my heart just sank. But when she explained what the issues were, I understood right away because I've dealt with those issues in the, in the regular line church for a long time. And so that's one reason why I was able to see things as clearly as I did when I, when I came in and start, I started seeing the issues that were, were at play. But till we all come into the unity of faith, I pray for that, that day within this movement. And of the knowledge of the Son of God, that's us. We're the ones who are trying to tell the world about the Son of God. Unto a perfect man, that's the last generation, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is what God is waiting for. Romans 8:18 8, and 19 For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed where out there in Christ alone at the cross in us we can't take a pass I remember my brother Barry he uh, when I was in high school I was I was just a troublemaker I, I really wasn't a very spiritual person in my early years in high school, and he used to give me phone calls and uh, share with me Ellen White quotes, and he'd talk about the 144,000 and what, what God expected of them, and I just remember thinking, and I even told him out loud, I said, that's not for me. I said, I want to be one of those that just makes it in. You know, these guys are putting in work, you know. Um, this is dedication that's behind behind them. I saw it from an early age, but I purposed in my heart, I didn't want to have to do that. I wanted to make it in like all the evangelicals are going to make it in. Just believe. And um, I kept repeating that, that trumpet sound until God finally woke me up. 
and said, you, you're not going to make it. If you keep this up, you will not make it. Verse uh, 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. So it's not only Christ that's waiting. All creation is waiting for this to happen. We can tell by looking around us that this world has had enough. Have you had enough? Obviously, you haven't had enough, or else we'd be ready. We need to realize, we need to come to the point and bring ourselves to the point where we have had enough and we're done with this sick, sin-filled world, and we're done seeing death. We're done seeing people hurt and get sick and die, and one generation die off and wander through the wilderness, and another generation wander through the wilderness. There were not multiple wanderings in the type. What are we doing? What are we doing here still? So now we're going to transition, and we're going to take a look at... um, the spirit of prophecy, and we're going to see some probably clearer language to us um, about the last generation, and it'll probably paint uh, a better and and clearer picture uh, for our minds what uh, God is trying to tell us. Testimonies to Ministers 506, the latter rain falling near the close of the season, there we have our theme again, it's the, the theme of harvest, Sometimes this is even called harvest theology, and rightfully so. The close of the season ripens the grain and prepares it for the sickle. The Lord employs these operations of nature to represent the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, God's allowed to do that, right? (laughs) Are we allowed to uh, take things of creation and compare them with God? We're told not to, but God can do it. Because God has a perfect way that he has used in his word to describe how the Holy Spirit works in our lives and, uh, and how he's going to prepare us for his coming. As the dew and the rain are given, first to cause the seed to germinate and then to ripen the harvest, so the Holy Spirit is given to carry forward from one stage to another the process of spiritual growth. The ripening of the grain represents the completion of the work of God's grace in the soul. Now that's crystal clear. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the moral image of God is to be perfected in the character. We are to be wholly transformed into the likeness of Christ. This doesn't say you have to live a sinless life from beginning to end, but God can bring you to the point where you will not sin by even a thought. That's the faith we need to have. We need to have faith not in ourselves, because that's what people try to say, that if you believe this, it's works, it's legalism, and you're just focusing on yourself. That's not what this is at all. Your faith is in the one who will do it. The Bible says he will do it. And he doesn't do it while we sit back and do nothing, and we'll find that out. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, 214. Not one of us, and I think Michael read this earlier today, possibly, not one of us will ever receive, receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or one stain upon them. It is left with us to remedy the defects in our character, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Then the latter rain will fall upon us, as the early rain fell upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. Now, we're not in this alone, but this is reminding us that we have a duty. We are the ones that are going to make the choices whether or not to allow God to work in our lives through circumstances, through through him whispering into our ear, this is the way, walk ye in it. When he does that, we have a choice. And we're either going to be transformed toward the image of Christ or away from it, depending on what our choice is. Here's the first mention in the spirit of prophecy that we have looked at today that mentions the seal of God and its relation to this uh, last generation. So what is the seal? Um, I know that 
that I have asked a lot of friends and relatives about, um, about the seal of God, and I'll, I'll ask you the same question after we read this quote. Manuscript 73, 1902. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. So you can't just believe the truth. We already, we already uh, saw that, God's, uh, that, the, that the latter rain are doctrines. They're God's word. They're what he wants to teach us. He's the teacher of righteousness. And if we will listen, we will progress, just like any student. If we don't listen, we will digress. But what I've asked my friends is when you are sealed, at the time that we are sealed, does God take from you the power of choice? Do you really believe that? So what this would mean, well, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question then. If God does not take away the power of choice, do you have the power of choice to sin after the close of probation, if you are among the sealed, the 144,000. Exactly. Is there, is there a possibility of failure? That's not an easy question to answer, is it? But some of, many of you are saying yes. Let me share something with you. Ellen White talks about Christ in this way. Could Jesus have failed? You just said, many of you just said yes, Jesus could have failed. Are we going to be in any better position than Christ when we're sealed? Okay, so we're getting to something here, right? She says, when he came to this earth, he came to this earth at the risk of failure and eternal loss. We're going to find out tomorrow that that same eternal loss is going to be in play during the the um, the time of trouble. God is staking His universe on the promise He is going to make to the universe that this group will not sin, no matter what. But that does not take away our power of choice. That's why this is so powerful. We still have the power to choose. If God would take away the power of choice during the time of trouble, Satan would cry foul. If he took away our free will, he would say, not fair. He's not going to do that. Now, I'm not saying, I want to make it perfectly clear, I am not saying for one moment that I believe that God's plan will fail or his people will fail. They will not. This is why our theme exists. He held back those winds because we were not ready. He's not going to allow those winds to be released until we are. But guess who doesn't believe his promises? The evil one. You know why Satan doesn't believe the promise that we will be holy still? Because he has got some records of ours. He knows each and every one of you better than you know yourselves. He knows your weakest points. He knows where you have failed. And he thinks he knows where you will fail. And like a predator in the desert... They go after a pack of animals, and who do they focus on? The weakest of the weak. Let me ask you for a moment. Did Enoch have an advantage over us? No. He's an example for us not an unreachable character, carrot on a stick that we'll never attain. He is a, an example for us, and we'll see that even more clearly at the end of this quote. Yet he lived a life of holiness. He was unsullied with the prevailing sins of the age, 
in which he lived, so may we remain pure and uncorrupted. He was a representative of the saints who will live amid the perils and corruptions of the last days. Is that you and I? I pray that it is. For his faithful obedience to God, he was translated. So also the faithful who are alive and remain will be translated. He is an example for us. Do you know what Ellen White said about Enoch's? Yes, she said, there are Enoch's in this our day. That's Christ Object Lessons, I think, page 331, somewhere around there. So she acknowledged that in her day, there were Enoch's, people that would not sin by even a thought, though their lives were in, in jeopardy. This is possible for us. If we don't believe it's possible, then we have no hope in being part of this last generation that will stand during the time of trouble. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, there, there she goes with works again. See, brothers and sisters, this is not works. She's telling us how salvation works, how true salvation works. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of the penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people upon earth. This work is more clearly presented in the messages of Revelation 14. Have you ever viewed Revelation 14 as a people putting away the sins in their own personal lives? Some of you have. Those are the three steps that we must go through. Those are the three experiences that we need to live to become the 144,000. We need to be more intimately acquainted with the content of those messages and how they will lead us and guide us to where we need to be when Christ appears. I already mentioned that uh, Ellen White calls those messages three steps, the first, second, and third angel's messages. That's, um, I think, Spiritual Gifts 168. Youth Instructor, August 20, 1903. This tells us a little bit about how, how God works in us and how we can allow him to work in our lives and upon our character. Actions. What has to happen before an action in our lives? Right? We have to make choices for actions to happen. No one can compel you to do something. No one can force you to do something or take an action. You must, you must give the consent of the will. Actions, often repeated, form habits. Habits form character. We've been talking about character today, character perfection. We won't reach character perfection if we don't understand this principle. Again, this is not something that someone just clicks on in your mind and all of a sudden you are a sinless follower of God. It's a process. We need to be taught these things. We need to understand what temptation is. Who's the only one that can understand how you are tempted? Christ, because he was tempted in all things. He can understand. He has walked a mile in your shoes. Patiently perform the little duties of life. So long as you undervalue the importance of, the, of faithfulness in the little duties, your character building will be unsatisfactory. In the sight of omnipotence, every duty is important, even the little things. The Lord has said, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. In the life of the true Christian, there are no non-essentials. How easy it is for us to just say, you know what, this matters over here. I know this matters to God, but that, that won't matter to him. I can, I can be weak or lax in that point, and it'll be okay. That's not what this is saying. There are no non-essentials. There aren't decisions in your life that God doesn't care about. He wants to lead you and guide you and whisper into your ear 
and tell you what choice to make. And it's our, it's our choice to either obey or disobey those, that whispering voice. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5. Now is the time to prepare. The seal of God will never be placed upon the forehead of an impure man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of the ambitious, world-loving man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of men or women of false tongues or deceitful hearts. That's that guile we read about earlier. All who receive the seal must be without spot, candidates for heaven. I always grew up thinking the word candidate meant someone who gets on TV and lies to you. That's really not what a candidate is. Have you ever looked up the word candidate? It's one who wears a white robe. Candidates used to wear white robes so you knew who they were and you could watch what they do, whether or not you wanted them to be a leader. That's what a candidate is. Look it up sometimes. That's what the word candidate means. It comes from a Latin word. And um, with that in mind, it makes me think of the wedding feast. All of those candidates in rows and chairs. And who comes in to investigate those candidates? Our father. The one who prepared the, the wedding feast for his son. He comes in and he investigates and sees who is wearing that candidate robe And if you're not, you're thrown into outer darkness. Letter 184, 1901. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination. Many more years, as did the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequences of their wrong course of action. So why are we here still? Is it because of God or is it because of us? insubordination, our own insubordination. Just think about when Christ should have come and think about also all the things that have happened since then. You actually have the Civil War because we have evidence that Christ could have come shortly after 1844. You have all that death and misery. World War I, World War II, all of the other wars. Whose fault are those wars. If Christ would have come for a faithful people in the 1840s or 50s, whose shoulders does that blame lie on? God's insubordinate people. That, that sends chills down my spine when I think that the apple of God's eye are responsible for so much death and misery. Now, obviously, most of us wouldn't have been here but we wouldn't have known it. God's redeemed would have been in heaven and enjoying eternity. But, but we need to gain a clear perspective on why we're in the situation that we're in right now. And when we realize it's because of our own insubordination, that, that sparks a call to action. That sparks a call to higher and holy living and taking this whole thing seriously and stop playing around. Um, Being and choosing to be God's last generation is not a spectator sport. You can't just sit back and hope things happen naturally because they won't. The only thing that happens naturally is death and misery and sin. If we just go with the current, Satan's got us. We need to resist the devil. And what happens? He will flee from you. It takes diligent effort. It doesn't just take a spiritual mind. It takes effort and choice. And God will build and create in you a spiritual mind over time, and you can become one of the last generation that will stand in the time of trouble. Ellen White also says that If all who had labored unitedly in the work of 1844 had received the the third angel's message, she she said this in 1884. She said, years ago, the inhabitants of the earth would have been warned, the closing work completed, and Christ would have come for the redemption of his people. She says things like this many times. We had many opportunities 
to fulfill God's purpose for, for his church, but we failed to do so. So I'm going to end with um, the hallmark Ellen White quote for this concept of the last generation. And I hope it's a fitting way to end this presentation and leave, leave with you the idea that this is truly what God is waiting for. That it's not a fantasy, it's not a, um, a belief that was uh, concocted by some wild-eyed theologian in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, he was on to something. And I believe that it's clear in the Word of God that um, this theology is true and it's a reality and we need to take it serious. Christ Object Lessons, page 69. Most of my evangelical friends will scoff at me when I bring this up. Their first th the first thing they say is, she didn't really mean that. She didn't mean what you think she means. But these words are clear. Listen. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. We've covered that, right? Harvest theology. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the world would be sown with the seed of the gospel, quickly the last great harvest would be ripened, and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. There's nothing unclear about that, brothers and sisters. This is a promise. This is a bidding. And with God's biddings come what? Enablings. He will enable you to fulfill his purpose in your life. If you only surrender, he wants everything. He wants you to give Every aspect of your life. Remember we read there are, no, there are no minor issues. There are no minor choices. He wants everything. You can't lay part of your, your life aside and protect it from God and think that you'll be able to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. It will never happen. We were told it's a privilege. Do you really believe it's a privilege? Or are you like me when I was in high school and think that it's a burden? It's not a burden, it's a privilege. It's the highest privilege afforded mankind to be a part of his, his final generation. Do you want to have the Father say, have you considered my servants the 144,000? Can you imagine that challenge that he's going to give Satan one of these days? Soon, very soon he's going to give that challenge and Satan's going to say, you got me the last time, but I've got you this time because I've got a whole world filled with people and I know their weaknesses. He thinks he's got us and God knows. God's been waiting. And when God releases those wins, he, he, he knows he's got a winning team. He knows he has a group of people that will make him proud. So proud that he will hand over the positions that were held by the angels. He will share his throne with us. I was just telling uh, one of the brethren the other day how ironic it was that Satan wanted to be the, first, the third person in the council of God, right? There were two. The council of peace was between them both. Satan wanted to be the third, but he wanted to take it by force. Irony of all ironies the very individuals that are going to replace Satan and his fallen angels are going to give a, be given a place on the throne of God. If that's not irony, nothing is. Do you want one of those places? Do you really want one of those places? Amen. Let's get serious and stop wandering. Let's finish this work. Let's unite in the truth Unity does not come by compromise. Unity does not come by wanting to hang around with people that have the same hobbies that you do 
or that have the same demeanor that you do, or that you can easily get along with, or you're friends on Facebook with. Unity is based on truth, true unity. It's based on biblical truth. This is the unity that we need in this movement. We need to come together, we need to finish this work, and those who don't want to work like in the same lines that we do, that's fine. Let's finish the work. Let's pray. Dearest Heavenly Father, we have read promises and descriptions and some of these things are are a hard saying they're they're hard to hear they're hard to accept and sometimes they're hard to believe that you could do that in us that you could bring us to the point where we would rather die than sin by even a thought but we know that with your promises, you also give us the tools and the, and the resources and the training and the truth that we need to build and construct our characters into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that you can say of us one day, he that is holy, he that is holy, not he that will be holy after I come, but he that is holy, let him be holy still. We believe this, Father. We believe this with all of our heart, and we want to be among those people. We want to hand our lives over to you, and we want to allow you to do your work in us. And we want to cooperate at every step and allow you to transform our characters into the image of your Son. And to that end, I praise you and thank you for your patience with this insubordinate people that I am a part of and I am the worst offender. It is because of us that you delay, not because of yourself. It is because of us. And we repent of everything that we have contributed to further that delay. We don't want to delay anymore. We want to finish the work, and we want to make you proud, like any son or daughter wants to make their father proud. And we don't want you to be proud in something that we've done, but what we've allowed you to do in us. Thank you so much, Father, for, for trusting us with this mighty work. And we thank you for the privilege, the high and holy privilege that you've afforded us. In your son's name I pray, amen.